me everything is so far like behind like normal like normal time that he could theoretically work from home but he um says he, he doesn't get near as much done because he has to like tell he has to force things out people's throats like so many you know so many times a day it's just not like it's not even. Uh, there is a DGA. I don't think. Not, not uh, I mean, anyway, well, he lives, there he lives 40 minutes from his office, so it's not like a big deal. But it's like he was so stoked on the idea of working from home, and it just turned out to not be. Your entire team is remote. That's true. They can tell you. You can do more hours. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you can do for some reason, like, half the people oh, no, no, no. couldn't hear this one person. Like, okay, BGA 1 or 2? Uh, BGA 1. Oh, actually, I think just You have to probably tell it to be on BGA, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I get a yeah, we'll get a point. Uh, well, it's not the slide signal, but at least now I can see what the camera is. Yeah, it's just not working. It worked fine, it's too long. Yeah, I have some power, but I don't think that matters. It's my, my computer knows it's there because it's, I'm in the second screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I actually saw the screen screen And I'm not seeing the other thing. I'm not seeing the other thing. I'm not seeing the other thing. Uh, go ahead and uh, switch back to HDMI. <laughs> Alright. I mean, what was it? So you're trying to record the videos? I actually do. No, no, no. That's pretty good. So you're only hooked up for VGA? I do wish I had seen it. Not exactly. I was hoping it was going to give you a signal. Alright. Um, where did the other one go? Yeah, HDMI one. Plus, usually right There's also a two. Do you want to try the second set? Oh, we could. If this is trunking, I'm taking the. Oh, it knew right away and it switched. Yeah, it just doesn't like you too. Okay, how do you get the screen? Just unhooking it and hooking it worked. Okay. We're good. Continue. Yeah, we're good. All right. If you want to move around, well, I'll, I'll try not. I'll try not to. Ooh, I'm on. I'll try not to get too. Uh, I'll try not to be too dynamic. Although it's early in the morning, maybe I should. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Lee. Um, I'm one of the organizers. Just a really quick announcement. If you guys need anything, find somebody with a red badge. They're either a volunteer or organizer. They can help you out. Um, I do know that we have a code of conduct policy this year. We will be enforcing it, and I will be enforcing it, and you really don't want to deal with me. Um, this is Chet, and he's going to get going, and enjoy the conference. Thanks, Lee. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining me here at my, my first B-Sides Boston, which is quite exciting. I, 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 somehow, the, the, there was B-Sides here in Boston, because I guess there's with all the other events going on in Boston with security all the time, I, I didn't hear about it until this year. I think probably Jack's fault, maybe. I, saw, I think I saw it on Twitter, so I was really excited to come out and uh, share my, my research. For those of you who don't know me, I work at Sophos, and I'm not going to talk about Sophos other than to thank them for flying me here because they paid for my way, and that's pretty nice of them considering um, this is really about community and not about product stuff. And so I will say that, and I'll stop talking about them. But what the, the, the research I did to come up with the talk and why I'm here today sharing it is uh, has to do with Linux and the role Linux plays in the malware ecosystem, which is something that I do deal with a lot in my job. So I work in our Vancouver, Canada office. And I spend a lot of my time when I'm not tra uh, traveling to conferences and things doing research in the labs. 
And one of the things we keep seeing over and over again, or at least we suspected we were seeing, is that Linux plays a far bigger role in infecting Windows computers than Windows computers do. And we, I kind of wanted to look into that, and I had the opportunity to speak at the uh, Scale Linux conference in California in February. And I thought this would be a really interesting thing to like actually go through and see what, w within the confines of not breaking the law, what data can I take and actually go at and s see if I can analyze this at all and figure out, one, is it true? Two, what, what can we find is really happening out there? And then based on what we find, what kind of advice or what types of things might we be able to do to do a better job as a security community at protecting this Linux infrastructure that's largely uh, ignored often in, in a lot of business environments. So where, and, you know, and is that even where we're finding it? Like, is it businesses? Is it under somebody's you know, a, a couch on a Raspberry Pi? Like, wh where is the source of this problem? And what might we be able to do to reduce the impact to, uh, from malware distribution to the regular community. So, um, oh, this is off. Try that again. There we go. Uh, in, in the process of this, I found out a few interesting things. Um, apparently, penguins are rather angry birds. Um, I, I don't know if it's because they can't fly. Um, apparently, they have quite a temper. This is from the National Geographic. But when I was looking through all this stuff, um, when I called the presentation, when penguins attack, I decided to Google that. And I found out all kinds of information <laughs> about apparently really upset penguins. And it turns out um, Linus Torvalds, nice guy that he is, um, lovable uh, penguin person, uh, has been attacked by a penguin. Uh, at the Melbourne Zoo when he was there with Andrew Tridgell once uh, at a conference in Melbourne. And I don't know anybody else who can say they've been attacked by a penguin, but Linus is such a nice guy, even the penguins feel the same way much of the community does about him. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he's not here today, or I'll really hear it. Um, so why, you know, why are they targeting Linux, right? I, have, I had some ideas around why criminals are spending so much time investing in getting into Linux boxes. And of course, one of the primary reasons is most of us, unlike me, are not running it as a desktop environment, right? The vast majority of Linux boxes out there are servers, they're in data centers, they have you know, copious quantity bandwidth and redundancy, all this type of stuff, which makes them uh, you know, very attractive from a, a distribution of content standpoint, whether you're distributing legitimate content or not. So that was kind of an obvious one. I see there's a gentleman up front here with a main baseball cap on, so he may recognize the photo in the middle. Uh, does anybody know what that is? No? Border? Yeah, yeah, it's the US-Canadian border. There's about 3,000 more miles of that where that came from. Um, but it's undefended, right? It's the largest undefended border in the world. And I think you could almost consider Linux probably one of the largest undefended pieces of territory on the internet, next to Cisco routers, perhaps. Um, there, there's just very little being done to protect them at all. And when you look at systems, it doesn't matter whether there's integrated things that could be used to help. It's not really being used. I mean, when we're looking at uh, 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 remediating environments with our clients and our customers, we're seeing that, no, yeah, okay, you got a firewall built in, but you didn't turn it on. You didn't actually block anything. And this stuff's, you know, all these things are running by default. I mean, Solaris up until I think 11 or 12 was still running Telnet by default. And of course, nobody would bother to turn the firewall on, you just of course leave Telnet exposed. Why wouldn't you? Um, but this is you know, very attractive again because from the criminal standpoint, if it's undefended, that doesn't just mean it's easy to get in. It means it's easy to stay there as long as you want, right? Because if no one's looking for you, you won't be found. And we've seen a lot of examples of this in the past, in particular with uh, Samba servers in, in Windows environments, whether they're running on Mac or whether they're running on Linux or other Unix platforms. The truth of the matter is, if you've got Windows malware on a Samba box, you'll probably have it there for a couple of years while you run around and keep going, why are my machines still getting infected with X? And it's because there's this undefended Unix box hosting files to Windows that has an infected file on it that just keeps surfing it up over and over and over again. And ultimately, this translates money for the criminals because it's a, short, it's a small amount of investment to get a foothold, and they can stay there for a very long time. And it's a much better investment than perhaps a Windows box, which is going to get an antivirus update or an update from Microsoft in two weeks and suddenly not be accessible to them anymore. And the, obviously, this isn't a terribly new problem. I mean, it's actually been a rather bad 12 months for Linux admins, although I think, in a way, it's making us get a little better at this, maybe raising awareness. When, when things like, I remember, what was it? I think it was last month's Update Tuesday, since I'm in a Microsoft building, I use the right, correct nomenclature now, um, there was the HTTP sys vulnerability in Windows. And of course, 
nearly every admin knows exactly where every Windows server is that might be running you know, web services in their environment. They know where their link servers are, they know where their IIS servers are, this kind of thing. And, and when Heartbleed happened, we had a lot of customers coming to us and actually we, we had to send them to you know, other companies, it's not something we do, but they were coming to us going, yeah, can you help us identify where all the Unix and Linux boxes are in our environment that might be vulnerable to Heartbleed? And we're like, uh, well, no, I mean, that's not what we do, right? I mean, you, you, need, you need Nmap, you need perhaps something from our friends at Tenable or whatever it is, but it's not something that we do, right? Like, no, no, we can't. You, you don't have an inventory? Well, not really. I mean, the, the Unix boxes, once they're up and running, they run all these obscure applications that we bought and they just sit there, right? And we, we, we don't even really know them. They get propped up and if they don't crash, we don't hear about them. And, and it was a real problem tracking down like, where are all these vulnerable copies of OpenSSL in our environment. And it's, it's really challenging because we haven't had to have the quick reaction force team in place for most of this equipment for years. It has largely been stood up and left alone. And, and there's a lot of different examples of uh, things that, you know, we, we've been doing, we have a sinkhole for the Linux RST uh, B malware that came out in 2002, of which we wrote about on our blog in 2008, six years later, and at that time there were still 12,000 machines calling home to our sinkhole, and I just checked a few weeks ago, and we're still at like 8,500, so we've cleaned up 4,000 in the last six or seven years, and more than two-thirds of the ones we saw in 2008 are still infected and calling home to our, uh, our, our honeypot, or, or, well, I mean, it's not really a honeypot, right? I mean, it's a, it's a sinkhole, but you know what I'm saying. So we, th this kind of supports some of the idea that unfortunately when these things happen, they're going to be out there a really, really, really long time. Um, and the, the last part of that that, um, that kind of led to all this was Dark Leech. I don't know if most of you have heard of Dark Leech. Uh, the best research on it was done by uh, a guy in Japan whose website is unixfreaks.jp. Uh, he did all kinds of really uh, great research on it, but in essence, it's an Apache module that was being compiled on Linux boxes that were compromised. Nobody's really come to any conclusion as to how the criminals were getting on the box to begin with, whether they were capturing credentials, whether it was the old Debian SSH vulnerability from the random number generator being poor. It's really not clear how they were getting on, but once they were on, what they were doing is they were compiling an Apache module that was dynamically injecting malicious JavaScript into the web pages, which is kind of the ultimate nightmare for trying to figure out how to convince an admin they have a problem, right? Because the, the, it would whitelist basically their own IP ranges and the IPs of all the security vendors to not do the injections, and it never modified any of the, disk, uh, the files on disk. So we would see a website that was infected and we'd call up the, the person and say, hey, your website's infected, you're distributing at the time black hole exploit kit and it's infecting all these Windows users, you should clean up your website. And they'd go and look at index.html on the disk and go, no, it's not been modified for three years, it's fine, there's no problem. We're like, no, 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 you don't understand. No, I'm surfing to my own site, I'm viewing source in Firefox, it's fine. They're like, yeah, go do it from home on the cable modem with Internet Explorer and see what you get, right? Because, well, don't do that from home, you'll be infected. Um, but, but this was the problem. Convince someone that they have a problem was really hard with it because there was no easy evidence for administrators to see. You had to try to talk them through, like, which Apache modules are loaded and which ones do you expect to be there and is there one that you don't expect to be there? And they were dynamically compiling this on the boxes as well, so it wasn't very easy to write a signature to find those modules for antivirus or other types of products. Um, and, and, and most, again, another problem we have in the Linux and Unix world that makes it very appealing for the criminals is you usually leave all your tools laying around on the floor like a playpen. Um, GCC's there, Perl's there, everything you need to build anything you need to do criminally, you don't have to download a toolkit, it's already installed for you because the administrator probably never removed those things before they put the machine into production. And that, that chart there was actually about a month after Dark Leech came out, almost a little more than two-thirds of every infected web page we saw was actually being hosted by Dark Leech at that time. So what I did, my methodology, um, I went into the lab. Um, I'm actually repeating this literally from my hotel room with my other laptop as we speak. I wish I had, um, I wish the dates had been different, but I got approval to do this quarterly for a while to track the differences over time. And so we're exactly three months from when I originally did my research. So I'm gra I just grabbed the May 1 to May 6 midnight data to go through and do this again to see how it compares to what I did back in February. So I will probably be posting information on the blog and maybe doing future talks on kind of how things change over time. Because after Heartbleed, I was really interested in the idea that 
will we actually see a material impact of the number of machines, say, participating uh, in distributing malware, participating in do uh, DDoS attacks, et cetera, after a major flaw that potentially allows people access into these systems. So as we kind of go through the quarters, we'll be able to kind of watch and see if there's variations based on big name vulnerabilities that we're all supposed to panic over. Uh, but what I did is I went in the lab and I just grabbed every single malicious URL that came in from midnight on February 1st until 23.59.59 on the 6th. Uh, that turned out to be 178,635 URLs that uh, we had detected that week. And then um, I broke them down into two buckets that are not accurate, I will say. So that, that we don't look at every URL clearly to know exactly what's there as a human being would do. But largely we throw them into buckets as either what we consider to be a legitimate site that's been infected with some sort of uh, JavaScript injection, an iframe tag, something that makes it part of the attack chain but in and of itself doesn't have anything malicious on the site. It's just directing you down the funnel towards something controlled that's bad. And then known malware destinations or malware repositories which are typically controlled by the criminal themselves and would be the thing like an exploit kit or the actual Windows Trojan or Worm or whatever's actually being deployed that's uh, uh, dangerous at the end of the chain. And I did all this just with standard stuff, right? I grabbed all the URIs and I used wget and I used bash and I used nmap and I used uh, just all st your standard open source tools and, and just went into scripting mayhem on a couple of cloud instances so that I could pound away at things without having my internet provider get upset with us um, for pulling down too many malicious URLs in a row. Um, I had to dedupe everything, so in the end it ended up being, there was 121,121 unique IPs involved in the scan uh, from the 178,000 URLs. I'll point out a few other, I've got a couple, of, there's a few things in my data that I know will skew it a little bit, so I'll try to point those things out as we go along because um, I wasn't really able to remove all the variation based on um, what I could do, again, without breaking the law. I had to be very careful to not like test if a system is actually vulnerable to something in a way that my lawyers wouldn't like. Um, it's a, any day that starts with calling the lawyer because of the research you're doing is a bad day. Um, so I was maybe exceedingly cautious sometimes. So looking at the web server distribution overall with the entire URL set, this is what I ended up with, which is you know 36.5% for Apache, 20% for Microsoft servers of various flavors. That's not just IIS, that's anything that identifies itself as a Microsoft web service that was in that data set. So that could be things that are running just HTTP as a transport and identify uh, um, uh, the server string as being something Microsoft related. Uh, Nginx at about 15.9% and then um, really kind of falls off after there. Although immediately when I started looking at this, I thought, well, this, is, this seems suspicious to me without looking at any other data that Google web servers would be 9.6% of my data set. Like, what? No, you can't download the Google web server, and I know Google's big, but they're not 9.6% of the internet. Did I do something wrong? So I, ha I did dig into that a little further as I went along to go, because it just, it stood out as odd. I mean, I expected Apache to be the biggest, and I wasn't quite sure what the distribution would be, but it seemed a little odd to me. Um, so then I thought, well, I've got to compare that to the Netcraft data that's out there for the same time period to see what is the internet in general running compared to what I'm seeing. And so I started comparing that, and, and, the, and this is where some numbers start to come out. And nothing, again, the Google number really jumps out, um, but, but the rest of this kind of seems sort of in line, right? I mean, IIS was below average, which, again, part of my suspicion in that Windows machines, whether they like to or not, are kind of forced to be better maintained when they're on the internet. Um, <laughs> Apache, no, I did, in my Apache numbers, I did exclude anything that said Apache Win32. So I tried to take the Windows Apache boxes out and put them in the Windows category, even though that may not be fair. So it's not entirely IIS. There's probably three or four Apache Windows servers that are in that number. I mean, literally, when, when I went through the numbers, there was two OS X machines, six FreeBSD, and then the rest were either Windows or Linux um, uh, on the infected host. Um, I don't know what the two Mac ones were. I wonder if that's like a proof of concept. I must have stumbled across some other researcher's laptop, maybe. Um, but the, the, the rest of the data, you know, it's pretty close. I mean, minus 3.2%, plus 1.3. These are variations that aren't statistically significant. The Google one was interesting, though, and, and, and I, I will go into that a little bit further. Um, then I took them into the separate buckets that I created, and I went, all right, let's look at just the infected sites. So these are the ones that are... Apparently somebody's WordPress blog for their child's soccer team 
that is to tell the schedule for the next few months that didn't get the latest fix, right? Maybe then it was compromised and that was part of an attack chain, um, as opposed to probably, you know, controlled by Moldovan criminals. And that, you know, now the numbers shift pretty dramatically, right? Again, Microsoft is even less part of that um, than, than, uh, than the other number. But now Apache jumps into the lead. So this kind of supports some of my theories that these boxes are likely maintained by amateurs. And that, in my experience, aside from, for example, the Akamai's of the world who may be using Nginx as a proxy to host a lot of things, so you do see Nginx pop up from large scale uh, content distributors and that kind of stuff. You also see Nginx much more often administered by professionals. You don't see amateurs running Nginx. It's just too damn difficult. Yeah, Jack. Do you see ancient Nginx a lot? Well, I don't know. What's ancient? Version one? Older Nginx. Just in some of my stuff, one of the things I've seen because the, I'm just guessing, but because of the places you use Nginx, they have fewer smaller maintenance windows, and so when Nginx bones come out. I, I didn't actually measure it, but anecdotally looking at it, I, was, I would say it was half and half modern and older. Because I, I think what, the current version is what, 2 point something, right? Yeah. 2.2 2 or... Yeah. The, the version numbers are frequently similar to Apache's popular version numbers, which makes it hard to remember, because it's like 1.3 and 2.2 2 or something, right? Um, anecdotally, yes, I didn't look at it, though. But I've got all the data. It would be interesting to look at. Um, because cause that was one of the things I did look at for uh, the Apache boxes in particular to decide, are these boxes being patched? Like, are they just being propped up and ignored? Or are they being patched? So by I was able to go through, for example, and see that oh, this version string clearly is a CentOS box, and yet it's running you know 2.2.23 Apache, which means for CentOS six or whichever rev that is, that it's now at least a year not patched, because even though they backport all this stuff in CentOS or Red Hat, the truth of the matter is they still increment the version numbers. They just don't match maybe mainland, mainline distribution. So I did go through a bunch of the numbers to find those types of version things and, and, and trying to you know, conclude whether uh, these boxes are being maintained. And, and in almost every case, it was all old stuff on the Apache. But I didn't do the same with Nginx, mostly because the numbers ended up being so different. I mean, these, these Nginx numbers are pretty small. And when I go through these Nginx numbers, a lot of these are behind services that are known to proxy in front of things, so I don't even know if they're actually Nginx, right? So things like Cloudflare is in front of this site, and I go and I look at the ASN and I go, well, I know it's Cloudflare, so I don't really know what's behind Cloudflare. I just know that whatever's behind it is now sending, you know, distributing malware. So I, that was why I didn't, but I'm, I'll, maybe, you know, what I see in a few weeks, maybe I'll, we'll talk again. I'll go through the data and just take a look, because I've got it all there, it's easy to parse. Um, and the, the Google number suddenly vanishes when I look at the infected sites. So that starting to give me clues as to what role Google IPs or Google's web services are playing in this stuff because clearly this isn't uh, regular everyday people in any way. I mean, it's almost non-existent in these numbers. It's pretty small. Um, but, but Apache's in the lead there. And then we look at the malware repositories or known malware destination side of it and we get a very different look. This is where you know Google just completely jumps out into the lead again, where on the whole internet, Google's 2.3% of the web servers, and yet it's 12.8% of infected web servers that are distributing malware, which is just enormous um, uh, comparatively. And again, you know, Microsoft a little under, Apache drops way off, and Nginx jumps up a little bit. And, and that's consistent at least with my biases in the lab when um, Russian criminals like Russian web servers like Nginx. They have a tendency to run their own servers on Nginx. I'm not sure if it's patriotism. I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure what it is, but it does seem to be a lot more frequently used by them for that purpose than um, uh, Apache. Also, uh, you know, uh, so I, you know the, the fact that it's a little over was sort of a, a suspicion of mine that that was going to be the case. But the Google number was the one I really wanted to look at. And the fact that Apache drops off tells me that um, uh, I, I really do think the Apache users are are probably amateur web administrators. They're not. They're probably people who propped up a one and one account for two dollars and forty nine cents a year to run a blog and then stop touching it, right? And and there is a lot of evidence. I, I'm not going to call out which particular host hosted a lot of these, but there were some rather large patterns that indicate large careless web hosts who seemingly, unless you light them on fire in public, won't do anything about their security problems. Um, and 
but the Google numbers, so I started going through the Google URLs, and I, th I think it was 98.3% of them were Blogspot and Blogger. And, and it surprised me a little bit, because I mean, Google's really, really good at stopping bad stuff on their network. Because if something bad happens in their advertising network, it's gone instantly, because of course that threatens their entire revenue model. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I'm not putting words in Google's mouth. And I, I've contacted Google, and I'm still waiting to see if they're going to do something. I'm waiting to see if that number's still there, actually. I don't really know. Um, whether they've managed to clean some of it up, but there was the average life of a blogspot URL hosting malware was like well over a week during when I was looking at this stuff. So that's really great for the criminals, right? You set up a free blogspot, you put some of your stuff up there, and you can live for a week on Google's bandwidth. That's a pretty good deal. Um, and, and there's plenty of bots out there automating, creating Blogger and Blogspot accounts. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not too trivial. The only thing that they seem to trip up on a little bit is still getting past some of the captures. Which um, apparently, if you, if you like free porn, you're helping create free Google Blogspot accounts for malware, from what I can tell, because that's what a lot of these guys are doing now. They're setting up free porn sites, and then to get the free porn, you have to solve a CAPTCHA, but actually, it's a Google CAPTCHA, and you're solving the Google, Google CAPTCHA for them to create another Gmail account, or another Google Plus, or another Blogspot. Awesome. See, free porn is not free. <laughs> um, so that, that was what the Google numbers are. So I'm hoping Google can do something about that, and that might actually have a, a bit of impact. Because from our perspective, blocking things, looking at it from protecting our customers, known malware destinations often cluster in certain ASNs and have a reputation, and that's great. That makes it that much easier for things like web filtering products, whether you know whether it's OpenDNS or WebSense or you know the, the products that we sell, these types of things. Reputation is an important component of this, but we can't, of course give Google a reputation that's negative. So when you can hide amongst the good guys, it makes it that much harder for, for us to try to help put things out there that are protecting people from getting to dangerous stuff on the net. Um, I tried to see what I could see about this stuff. Uh, this is a pretty useless chart, but I'll talk about what I saw. Um, well, quite clearly, I saw cPanel on most of the infected sites, which goes back to supporting some of this theory, right? Like the almost 25% of them had a old vulnerable version of cPanel running on them. That doesn't mean that's how the bad guys got in, but to me that says you're an amateur administrator, right? Professional Linux admins don't run cPanel. And if you're running cPanel, that's probably one of these cheap prop up host things again because you don't know what Linux is, you just wanted a blog and you went click, click. And, and uh, whether they're getting in that way requires actually exploiting it, and I didn't do that. But I thought it was interesting, because compared to the malware repositories, it was almost not, you know, drops right down to only a couple percentage points. Now, these numbers I know are absolutely wrong, but what I did get from these numbers looking at them, um, by the way, I couldn't identify any of them as running Drupal, which surprised me. Um, but I did see plenty of Joomla and WordPress, and primarily WordPress in, in the data set. Um, and in the WordPress, though, it was all version 3 and earlier. So this was another thing that was sort of like lesson learned, which is automatic updating does work. Since WordPress 4, you really can't lag behind on the version of WordPress you're running, despite how many times there's vulnerabilities. As soon as a user visits your site, it triggers a part of its script to check to see if there's an update, and it will fix itself. And I didn't really see any WordPress 4 that was identifiable in the data set, yet um, almost all of it was WordPress 3 with a few WordPress 2s sprinkled in there. Uh, of the ones that I could tell which version. Now, there's not. A, I, I didn't go to like ex great lengths here. I pretty much looked on the sites that were running WordPress for slash readme.html and grabbed the version number out of the readme file because nearly no one cleans that file up and it has the version number in it. Um, so I, I just looked for that as a way to do a quick check to see what I was seeing. Yes, sir. Maybe a stupid question. How do you identify the cPanel? Um, how did I identify the cPanel? I have to look at my script. I don't remember. Um, it, it listens on a different port oh, number. Just four? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was based on the port number, and then I grepped through the HTML I got back to see if it had the header saying, welcome to the cPanel admin, blah, blah, blah. So those numbers are probably low in that not all of them will match what I was looking for. A lot of this was hacked and bootstrapped together. So um, as far as the, the version checking stuff, because I... I, I the best way to check for a lot of these things is to often poke to see if how it responds, and I didn't really have the opportunity to do that. So you check both the ports and the banner, basically. Ports and banner, yeah. So that's conservative, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I, what I did, in addition to like end mapping to help me with with version identification, I was also I w getted everything into a folder, and then I was just parsing through everything I w get and looking for different patterns to see if I could identify something as a cPanel or a WordPress or a Joomla. 
Um, but but the WordPress ones largely being out of date, older versions to me, like I said, I was I was somewhat encouraged by that because again that tells me like we do need to make this stuff automated and stop involving human processes in this, right? Like if 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 the automatic updates can happen, I'm not hearing people complaining that their WordPress sites are blowing up because they're automatically updating, which means I guess the quality control is okay. As long as the quality control is okay, it's keeping them out of danger. And the people that were asked to go click a button apparently can't click a button. No, again, I don't know that that's how they got in, but I suspect that's how they got in. Um, I wanted to make sure that my data set when I put them in the buckets was kind of right, so I just looked at our antivirus detection names to see if everything kind of lined up. So when I looked at the ones that were categorized as infected sites, I kind of got back exactly what I, I should get back in essence, that um, they were either search engine optimized, manipulated, they have malicious JavaScript redirections in them, they have malicious iframes inserted in them. But what I'm not seeing here is Traj Config or, or you know, I'm not seeing actual malware names, which means they probably are just part of the redirect chain and they're not necessarily um, uh, hosting malware themselves, they're just uh, uh, directing people toward malware. When I look at the detections for the known malware destinations, then I get you know pretty much everything under the sun, um, a, a mixture of all different malware names and things, which again makes sense because some of those sites are going to be running exploit kits where you're going to see a lot of things like uh, Facebook and HTML uh, and off Java, uh, obfuscated JavaScript detections for things that are, are exploit kit based, and then you also see things that are actually malware like Traj Agent, Traj.net, you know, Excel Macro, blah 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 blah. So I felt pretty good that my data wasn't terribly off. What was interesting to me is that I did this about a month before the Verizon Deber came out, and my numbers actually almost matched their numbers exactly on Android malware, which was, I think, surprising to both of us. When I read the Verizon report, I think Verizon reported 0.3% of malicious sites distributing Android malware, and in my results it was 0.24, um, which is pretty similar enough considering we used entirely different methodologies that I felt confident that neither one of us is lying. Um, and that was a lot higher than I expected because we're not really seeing exploits against Android very often. It's just drive-by downloading, right? You get the little, if you're an Android, you get the little arrow, the download arrow in the toolbar at the top of your phone. It doesn't run it automatically. It depends on you going, oh, what did I just download? Oh, yes, I would love to see sexypix.pdf and opening it or whatever it is, right? So um, I, I, I mean, 0.3% is not a big number, but it is when you consider it's 178,000 URLs, and that's every week. Um, I, was, I was a bit surprised by that, and I'm wondering, you know, Google last week or week before pretty much said that uh, Android malware is not a problem, which from a standpoint of a well-behaved user, that's absolutely correct. I don't know anybody that's been infected who hasn't done thing, gone off the, you know, gone off the rails a little bit. I mean, we see 3,000 malicious uh, samples every week for Android, but it's all Trojanized Chinese apps and stuff. It's not stuff that's hitting everyday people. But the concern with the fragmentation of the Android malware system is that if these, if 0.3% of sites now are distributing Android malware to people, the question is when they decide to exploit a bug in Chrome that's not been fixed on 98% of Android devices, but Google says it's fixed because they checked it into their GitHub repo or whatever, you know, that them having checked it into the source code doesn't really do us much good. Um, if somebody decides to start exploiting those, that number could really go up really easily because there's there's no defense on Android, unfortunately, and patches are almost assured to never make it to your phone. Despite the fact I still carry an Android. Um, I also want to look at it uh, graphically regionally. Now, I, my apologies if you're colorblind because this will be entirely useless. Um, I didn't think of that when I was doing it, and it took me so long to render on this laptop without a GPU that I wasn't going to do it again to change the colors. Um, but what you see is green push pins and red push pins. The green push pins represent sites that were distributing malware, and the red push pins represent sites that were infected. And I wanted to look at it regionally and see if I saw any patterns. And really, for North America, I didn't see any patterns other than wherever there's data centers, there's a lot of push pins, um, right? So all the usual suspects that you would think of, you know, you got Dallas and you've got San Francisco and Los Angeles and Chicago and all the places that all the big guys are doing content distribution. Uh, Washington DC area, et cetera. So I, there's really not anything discernible in North America that makes much sense other than 
Since we host the vast majority of the world's everything on the internet, we have more of everything than everyone else, um, which um, isn't terribly useful. Looking at Europe, though, it gets a little more interesting. And you see, most of the red is in the west. And as you go east, it gets greener and greener and greener. And less and less infected websites as we head into uh, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, etc., cetera, and, and, and much more of the sites that are infected being in the West, in France, in Germany, in UK, et cetera. So uh, supporting of our biases again. And, and in just in case I didn't know if my data set was correct or not, um, I also did Asia Pack, in which case you can see mysteriously there's only green pushpins in China. Um, no red pushpins at all. There's one red pushpin in Hong Kong. So either China runs a really, really clean network or the Great Firewall conveniently only lets in and out the exact traffic that they sp specify they want to and that all the malware is there but none of the infected sites because they infect our sites so that we can go there to get the malware is my theory. But um, uh, I thought it was kind of, you know, it's really, I realize that's quite hard to see so my, my apologies but um, I'm, I'll probably, I, I haven't posted the stuff on our blog yet. I may end up doing that so if you want to download the data or the images you can take a look. So looking at solutions, I, I try not to just complain about things. There's a lot of different stuff. And working for an antivirus company, clearly I think one of the reasons Windows servers are less represented, uh, one second, I'll just co come right back to you, um, underrepresented to a degree is that most people aren't insane enough to prop up a Windows box on the internet without making sure they patch it regularly and put antivirus on it. And um, that's not helping the Linux cause any that we're not doing that. And one brief plug is that we're giving away our Linux antivirus for free now, no strings attached, even for commercial use. So if anybody wants it, it's free from our website, and you don't have to pay anything or even tell us who you are. You can just take it and use it however you like. Uh, yes, sir? I noticed there are only green pins in India, too. Pretty much, yeah. But there's a red pin in Sri Lanka. Can you, can you speculate on why, too, can you speculate on why that would be? Uh, not, not in particular, other than I would say that our data set is probably weak in that region, so it's probably not fairly represented, to be honest. Um, we, you know, our primary places of business are Western Europe and North America. We own a company in India that we bought a little over a year ago, but we haven't integrated our lab with their labs yet, so we don't have the labs data from all of our Indian customers. So my guess is it's weak data set would be my hunch. Um, I, the, the fact that we've got so much data in China and we don't do business in China is speaking a little bit to what that problem is, though. Um, but that would be my suspicion. Um, actually, for almost all of Asia Pac outside of Australia and New Zealand, we don't do a lot of business in that region, which means we have less people reporting in bad things to us. Was there another a couple of answers? Yes, sir. Oh, so you're just going to see a red pin if Sophos does business with somebody in that country? Well, not necessarily, no. It's not necessarily our customers that represent the red pins. It, it is our data set from the labs, but the thing is a lot of our labs data comes from clients detecting things and reporting back this website, I detected this malicious JavaScript on it. So the more computers that we have in a given country, the more likely we are to see things where people in that country surf. So it could be there's a lot of malicious Chinese websites that only target Chinese users. And we'd be blind to it because we can't sell our software in China without giving them the source code. So we don't sell our software in China anymore. Um, so you know, there, there are some gaps in the data set from that type of thing in that um, uh, some of our customers only buy web protection. Some may be only use, for example, antivirus. But if the antivirus customer detects a website that tried to infect their computer, we add it to our known bad websites database. And so we would have gaps potentially without clients in those countries. Uh, any other questions? I didn't see any numbers on Latin America. Yeah. I didn't really. Yeah, I didn't really talk about Latin America. Um, I, I didn't really draw it in the chart. I have the data, but, but I didn't look at it, so I, I don't. Other than it was an accidental exclusion, I guess. I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm I just. Curious. Um, yeah, and, and uh, if you want to catch me later in the day, I have all the data on my laptop. We can take a look. Um, yes, sir. All right. You said that you guys are putting your product out for free now. The the Linux AVs for free, yeah. What about your uh, info feeds, your bad site database, that threat detection, the analysis you're doing? Are you guys putting out feeds too? Well, the, the feed for that product, of course, the, the antivirus identities come with the free antivirus product, but we're not publishing the feeds, no. I mean, well, that's our business. Is what, that's what we sell, really. Oops. That's what we sell, really. But, um, I mean, if I didn't have to make money... I would love to. Um, I, I just wanted to no, no, yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah. I wanted to correlate your list with what's out on the internet. 
you know, I like you did the statistics, and in the last 45 days, I've been hit probably four mil times. So I'm getting hit, you know, every 10 days, a million lax. So I'm correlating and cross-referencing all that data and that traffic back. I'm trying to get as many lists as I can. Because I want to see, you know, if someone's hitting me one day, who else are they hitting? So these are incoming attacks at your servers, or? Always. Always. And, you know, they're everywhere. And when we looked at where we're getting hit from, our top three are, well, U.S. is first, <laughs> China's second, and Russia's third. Mm -hmm. Not when you put your map up, and I'm looking at my maps, I'm seeing... Well, keep in mind, this is where the bad stuff is being hosted. This isn't where the bad guys are coming from. Well, actually, on a lot of ours, they're coming from internal to, like, I get hit from software, I get hit from GoDaddy. We're talking right from their networks. Oh, yeah. So... Because it's the same compromised hosts that after they compromise them, they're using them to, to come out and attack you. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, and there, there is some overlap in that data set. But when, you know, the actual source of the attacks would be a very different map. Sure, sure. If we knew where the sources were. True. Yeah. Which some of them we do know where they are, and they're just places where we can't do anything about it. But um, was there, uh, I think there was another, was there another hand? No? I'll, I'll so anyway, I'm just looking at things we can do. So obviously, whether it's something from us or not, or whether it's free or not, there's a million different things that we're already not doing that we should be doing to protect these hosts, and we have to get a lot better at it. Um, one of the things, though, from my perspective is looking at it, it looks like tons and tons of amateurs, and I think the people in this room and at all the B-sides and things like this can have a lot of impact on is we really need to encourage our friends that run small businesses and the people that come to us for advice to stop propping up Linux boxes and uh, they're, they're just not capable of maintaining them and most of us don't have the time necessarily to do it for them. We really got to start moving people toward cloud services for this stuff like if you want a blog there's wordpress.com there's this there's that there's a million different things out there these days that are low cost or free and maybe we can start eliminating tens of thousands of these low cost VPS hosts that are just sitting there and getting owned over and over and over again right I, I think you know, the, the, the cloud service model's gotten really mature and can hopefully eliminate a lot of these amateurs and move them towards something that's more managed where they're not going to have these problems. And, you know, poking at these and seeing that most of them are running cPanel, most of them are running WordPress, this kind of thing, um, uh, seems crazy to me to think that I would suggest to the guy down the street that owns the flower shop on the corner by my condo that I would go, yeah, set up a Linux server in the cloud and then I'm going to teach you how to maintain it. Like it just, we have to get away from that. Um, two factor is another thing that um, when we look at our clients who come to us and go, our stuff got owned, can you help us figure out what happened? We're seeing that they're still using FTP to update their websites and that the credentials are being stored in queued FTP on their desktop. And there's a million Windows Trojans that clean out every password file on a machine when they infect it. That's how a lot of these are getting infected. Um, we're seeing SSH credentials even, same thing, you know, single factor. The SSH credentials have been emailed to the web contractor who's updating their site, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And their email, of course, is getting stolen when they're getting infected. Uh, there's, we, it's simply using two-factor, even with doing dumb things like emailing passwords around, would, would go a long way toward putting a stop to a lot of this. Um, in my, I, I didn't go through all of the data set with the script, but, but hand picking a whole few hundred and looking at them patching was again like almost none of them were patched. So, in addition to not being um, uh, having strong credentials, etc., they weren't being really fixed. I, that's kind of a weird image to represent SSH, but. I thought it was an interesting point um, um, to, to, to use, but you know, we really um, got to start using SSH and secured stuff. Saw tons of FTP. FTP was present on over 50% of the machines that I was looking at. Now, whether there were any credentials you could log into that without trying, I don't know. But I suspect if FTP is there, it was being used for publishing to those sites, and that's a big problem. Um, and the other part is the tools. Now, we're, we're seeing this on Windows and on Linux. Um, leaving your tools around is a really bad idea. We're, very rarely are we seeing in a Windows compromise where the criminal goes and retrieves his own toolkit anymore because there's a chance it'll be detected or blocked at several different layers in the network. And instead, the, the criminals are using PS exec because you use it yourself and it's already there. And they're using TCP dump because you were lazy and you didn't delete it after you sniffed that segment on the network where you're looking for something. And we're seeing you know, the same problem in Linux except it's the, the, all the tools are already there. You have to take those tools away. If you're going to prop these boxes up, you really need to be removing things like Netcat, 
TCP DOM, um, uh, GCC, you know, if, if your website's not based on Perl, you don't need Perl to run Apache, right? Like, don't have these things laying around because it makes it very easy for these guys to script DDoS attacks like we saw on the Xbox and PlayStation networks over the Christmas holiday. Um, over and over again, they're mostly using things that we've been careless and left around, and we, make, we can make their job a lot harder if we take away that tool set. And then what really scares me is thinking about tomorrow. Um, I, I don't like the term Internet of Things, but the truth of the matter is if we're talking about Internet of Things, they're almost all running Linux. And if we think we're bad at patching our GoDaddy, um, go ahead and try to patch your smart refrigerator. And um, these things really concern me because it's just, you know, one, these, these, the, the fixes aren't becoming available at all for these things. And, um, yeah, and, and the fact that you have to know, I mean, if I called my mom and said, yeah, there's new firmware for your LG dryer. You need to make sure you get that firmware update, Mom. Uh, one, I think she'd be very concerned if I said the word firmware to her. And why are we in this situation? So going back to, hey, WordPress auto patches. Now, if we're going to have these things out there, one, can we get manufacturers to agree to a security warranty? If I buy a washing machine and it has a three-year parts and labor, does it have a three-year parts and labor and patches? Why not? Right? Why is that not part of the contract? Why is not that part of the deal? Right? Smart TVs, all these things are, are we're, we're in this situation going, eh, we stopped shipping that model three months ago because the average lifespan of a SKU at Best Buy is six months. And because we're not shipping it anymore, you don't get updates. Um, I don't know how it is that when the belt breaks on my dryer, that's a warranty problem. That's a defect when it happens within the three years. But when the firmware goes wacky and anybody can hack it and I'll get into my Nest thermostat through it, that's not a problem. And so I think we need to start you know, trying to hold some of these vendors much more accountable because we're really going down a slippery slope by putting Linux in all these boxes. They're all running you know, 2.6.20 something kernels from six years ago and you know, known vulnerable versions of BusyBox the day they shipped. Um, and, and this is going to become a really, really big problem because it may not seem like a MIPS processor and some embedded device is all that powerful, but think again, it took down the PlayStation network. It took down Xbox Live from these tiny little MIPS devices that just had a, a little piece of malware put on them, right? So aside from the fact that Linux boxes are playing such a role in infecting Windows hosts, we have a really big nightmare of, you know, some of the, arguably, you know, really, uh, uh, cleanup resistant botnets like we've never seen. You know, we, we see a million Windows PC botnet and we go, oh my God, that's a giant botnet. That's nothing if you consider how many embedded devices can be infected and where we're putting them um, and the power they have. So I, that, that, that's, my, I mean, that's not really meant to be a doomsday thing. And last, lastly, I had to put the little OWASP thing in here. Um, while I was doing this research, I did see that of, the, of all the websites in the top Alexa 1000 last year that were infected, every single one of them hadn't done the OWASP top 10 things to secure their websites. So if we could even get the top 10 basics right, we would be a lot further down the road and we can't seem to do that. So I'm not really worried about advanced topics until we can try to at least get 10 things right. Um, other questions? That's pretty much what I had. I guess since you guys asked them while we were trundling along, we're good to go. I hope that was informative. If you want any of the data or any more of the info, please talk to me. We'll exchange cards or emails or we can dig through it. I've got all the stuff. It's nothing secret. I'm more than happy to share with anyone. And I hope you enjoy B-Sides Boss.